Man, what up, everybody? It's your boy, BQ. Welcome back to the channel, the first upload for 2024. Happy New Year to everybody. And, you know, my New Year's message to everybody is, fuck it, man. I know, um, you know, we get on social media and we see people make fun of the people who say New Year, new me, or this is going to be my year. Fuck them, man. Like, make it your year, dude. Like, I go into every year with specific goals and I know it's really hard to keep resolutions, but, but you can have a certain mindset, you know, and, um, we can always leave the past in the past, you know, fuck it, man. Just, just have your year. It doesn't have to be like last year or the year before, you know, and there's nothing wrong with goal setting and saying, you know what? It's the first let's do this, you know? So I go into all my years, you know, it's each and every year like that. I don't, I don't really care if people, you know, make fun of that mindset of, of it being a new year and a new you fuck all those people, man. Like you are what matters at the end of the day. So uh, that's my, my little bit of wisdom, if you will, for me, I'm not a man full of a whole lot of wisdom, but you know, that's the, you know, the message I do want to convey to you guys. Cause you know, I follow enough of you guys on Twitter to just know, you know, some of you guys post a lot of personal stuff on there, which is fine. You can post whatever you like, but um, it does not have to be like last year. You know, you can you can make all the necessary changes. Let's get into this. I've got a uh, we're going to talk a little TNA here. I've got a pretty good mailbag episode here. I'm not totally prepared for the responses. I just know I've got some good questions. I looked over them, uh, didn't really think about the answers a whole lot. Uh, so I could kind of go uh, go with the flow here. A couple things real quick. Some news from the last couple days. Uh, Santino got on social media, announced a uh, multi-team tag match coming at Hard to Kill. Now, although I think Santino was saying a whole lot of nothing with this announcement, because uh, he didn't actually announce the match, <laughs> I still commend them for getting on social media and and announcing shit announcing matches via video i've been begging them to do these kind of things for the longest time and maybe now they're kind of doing it out of necessity because they don't have a tv show to announce things but i i just i want to see more of that from their social media like i really fucking do and my personal resolution that i decided in 2024 and you know we'll see how much i stick to it <laughs> i'm going to try to stop writing their social media so hard their social media strategy. I don't have to agree with it or like it, but just like people don't have to agree with me or like what I say, I don't think it's a strategy for growth, but if their strategy is for clicks and for revenue, you know, traffic to their YouTube channel, then I guess they're doing things the right way. I I am not under the mindset of, of using social media to remind people about what you used to do. You know, like, if you're trying to promote, I know this movie came out like over a decade ago, but if you're trying to remote, promote the third Batman movie with Bane, you're not just going to keep showing nonstop clips of Heath Ledger's classic, iconic performance as the Joker. Yeah, it might get some people to go watch that movie again, and maybe some people will have some interest in the new movie, but are you really promoting Batman 3 or Batman 2? You know, um, I have that personal mindset. But I don't have to agree with that. I think their strategy is for clicks. And I don't mean that in a negative way. They just want clicks because uh, clicks equals revenue in YouTube. And if that's what they want to do, cool. Uh, but I'm I'm tired of beating the horse. And I'm not I'm going to try not to beat that horse in, in 2024. That's kind of my personal re resolution. Uh, but yeah, I'm I want to see more of this from their social media, even though I don't think the execution was like great it, still the overall concept was is what i want and i want to see them to try harder to do those kind of things and then they uh today starting today i think um noon or one eastern actually it's we're getting pretty close to that time now they're going to announce a uh, participant for the knockouts ultimate x new participant every day. And I, and I, again, I've just been begging for that kind of shit for the longest time. And I would be okay with them posting all this 
you know, bullshit on their social media. If there was just more of this, you know, that, that, that's all I'm asking for, you know, let us know, post the damn library, but do something to be forward thinking and moving forward as well. That's just really what I want to see. So, um, if I, you know, if I was, if I ran the company, which I don't, when I make these announcements, they would be video packages. You know, some of these girls were in the match last year, so I'd be showing clips from last year and then showing some favorable clips of them in the ring in general. And I would announce them that way. I would have small video packages, 30 seconds long, and put that on Twitter. I'm sure they're just going to put graphics out because I know this company, but I think that's what would take it to the next level. But again, um, that's just me saying what I would do. I think that um, what they're doing is doing it this way is great. This is, I just want more of this. I want more of this to create daily chatter, you know, and to put a singular focus on one knockout every single day, you know, so they're doing the right thing here. I hope that it's more of a mindset change and not, Hey, we have to do this out of necessity, but um, I'm going to give them, give them all the props in the world for that. Uh, before I get into this mailbag here, I do want to say that if in 2024, I cannot speak more favorably about this product than I do negatively, I think this is going to be my last year doing this because I, I cannot for myself justify I cannot justify to myself to keep on going if I'm if I have too so many complaints about how they operate. You know, I've I've sucked it up the last three years, and I've mentioned this a few times that about 2020, I'm gonna say it was like maybe end of 2021, beginning of 2022, I was done. And I had the tweet written out. I wrote the whole thing on my notepad on my phone and was getting ready to tweet out that I was. I couldn't do it anymore. Like the show was not making me happy. It was a chore. I was not enjoying it. And frankly, I was, I was as a fan, very offended when they said we do the best empty arena wrestling show. When I saw all these other companies really making an attempt and I don't even mean just wrestling, like outside of wrestling, other sporting events, making an attempt to being, um, to doing to presenting empty arena sports in some kind of original fashion or to do something that no one else was doing. And when I saw impact come out and just give us exactly what those words, you know, are empty arena wrestling, that's what they gave us. And then they just had the audacity to be like, we do this better than anybody else. You know, like that's where I was, I was really checking out. I said, this company is not self-aware, like, you know, so all these little issues that I had with the company, I said, they're not going to fix them, you know? So I was very, I was really unhappy watching the show for, for the pandemic, um, for a lot of 2021, you know, um, there were highlights, you know, like I still give their, their empty arena hard to kill a lot of props. I enjoy that show. Um, so I'm not saying everything they did was bad, but like overall, I just wasn't enjoying the show, wasn't enjoying the product and it wasn't changing. It was just, you know, I think I, I at least as a fan want to see some evidence that they want to improve in certain areas. And I just didn't see it. And I was like, I was done. I was so close to being done. And there was something that happened. I don't even remember. I think it was a, it might've been the bound for glory pay-per-view or something where the corner turned, they turned the corner a little bit and I started getting invested in the product again and, you know, decided, okay, I can, I can keep going. But, um, I, I struggled this past year with what they were doing. And I know that I've, I, I know I annoy people to no end when I'm talking about, we own the night, every single podcast and, and the red and, um, the background music and, the impact screensaver you know there's things i see every single week and i know it annoys people um, but it was because it annoyed me that much that i almost just had to say it i couldn't just not say it but um i'm optimistic they're going to change a lot of these things but I'm, I'm telling you folks if um if i find myself hating more of what they do than liking what they do i cannot justify going on past this year <laughs> so 
So we'll see. I, I hope that they do not do that to me. I hope that I, um, because we're going to, we're going to be riding a high after hard to kill for a couple of weeks. We are, um, but then they're going to come down to earth and that's when I'm hoping, okay, I'm still enjoying what they're doing. I still enjoy the vision. So, um, yeah, that's that. So let's get into these questions. I got some, some really, really good ones in the impact lounge engagement group on Facebook. So you can look that up if you want to get involved. Uh, that is not a group that I just want people to join just for the sake of it. You know, I really want some people to want to engage and, and talk in there, you know, like I know I say, I'm not going to bash impact social media, but they're, they're in the business of just collecting followers. They don't give a shit, right? Like if they're engaged or not, I, I care more in that group. That's why it's the impact lounge engagement group. I do not want people in there who are just in there to be there. You know, um, I want people to, to, uh, we, cause we got some great people in there and I, I you know, I just want people who want to want to engage and, and talk about the product. We make fun of the product a lot, you know, pe- um, we're very, it's very lighthearted, uh, but we also praise what's, what's good, you know? Anyway, let's get into this. Um, who do you think is the big acquisition? Who do you think it should be and who would bring more eyes to TNA? I'm still not letting the cat out of the bag as far as who I think the big acquisition is because I'm doing a, um, a separate upload for it that I'm uh, preparing additional graphics for. So right now I'm not getting into that. But as far as the type of wrestler that I think it should be, that's going to bring eyeballs. It has to be a guy or girl or plural who have some name value, but also want to reinvent themselves and be a part of something. I'm going to use W. Morrissey as an example. I don't think he wanted to be a part of Impact long term. But he wanted to come in and change the narrative on himself. And he did an incredible job of that. And it organically got over. If he was someone that was dedicated to the future of the company and wanted to be there, he'd be a a megastar for them right now. And I'll even go back to someone like EC3. I think EC3 brought eyeballs to the company. Obviously, they were not in their heyday of Spike TV TNA, but I think he brought eyeballs. He brought me back, to be honest. He was the number one reason I created my podcast. Number one was I loved EC3. So I think whatever guy or girl comes in, has to come in and not want to write off the coattails of what they maybe did in the past because we've already seen that from them. But if they come in, truly reinvent themselves because there's people in the WWE mid card who the fan base is always like, even the AW mid card where they're saying, yo, we want to see them do something with this guy. And then impact gets them. And a lot of the time would, um, try to recreate what they did before. And, it, it, you know, like Heath was a great example. People wanted to see Heath do something, and then they got Heath, and they just made him the same Heath that he was before instead of really allowing him to grow into something. So um, someone who wants to reinvent themselves but also be part of the t- future of TNA and not just be there for a booking, that's the kind of person I think um, – is going to bring eyeballs, you know, what's going to ultimately bring eyeballs is when you, when you have something that no other company has. That's, that's the simplest way I can put it. When you present something that no other company is presenting, it's people are going to watch it. Would you shine Would that's, that's hard to say. Would you sign Sean Spears? A thousand percent. Yes. I love Sean Spears. I loved him when he was, Ty Dillinger in the tag team with, I don't even remember his name. He was um, Kurt Angle's fake son. I've been a fan of him ever since that that period of time. He's an example of something, someone you can do something with if you really want to, because he is a, he is a, he has some. There's some remnants of what he used to do in WWE, but for the most part, like he has kind of reinvented himself, and um, he's one of the few that I would I would really elevate very quickly 
if I had him um, in my company, even though he was, you know, he did AW, he did WWE. I think the world of him, I always have. And I think that is the exact type of guy that they should go for. So I would be uh, very excited to see him. Um, his AEW work was really good. It, towards the end, he got kind of goofy, as everyone does on that show. But he's someone that um, I think he looks like a pro wrestler. He can walk and talk it. He can be a heel or baby face. He would be a baby face in TNA. But But he's someone I could, you know, I mean, he would be, if he was a heel and had a long world title run, I think it would be fantastic. But I think he would come in as like a baby face. And, uh, but I, I just think he would be really, um, really big for the company. If it could mean we can get his wife back, I know she's pregnant right now, you know. But again, he has to be, want, you know, want to be a part of, um, of things going forward. In this new TNA era, can we expect to see live TV shows in 2024 as opposed to tape episodes? I'm going to say no. Uh, we haven't seen him under the Impact umbrella at all. You know, this was something Dixie Carter did every so often towards the end, but we never, I don't think we ever saw them under Anthem. Um, if, if I were in charge, which I'm not, I would do them after every major pay-per-view, the four major ones, or at least the two major ones. Because what's one of the episodes of Raw every year that uh, the the ratings are through the roof and people are excited for? It's the it's the night after WrestleMania, right? The Raw after WrestleMania, and that has become so so ingrained in people's minds that it's going to be a huge show that they don't have to promote anything, and they don't have to overpromise anything. People just know in their head, hey, something's going to pop off, something big. Someone big is going to show up. Someone's going to return. Someone's going to debut. Like they just know, right? If if TNA can create that kind of atmosphere to where, the, you know, the, the the after Bound for Glory, after Slammiversary, really I would say after Hard to Kill 2 at least, maybe not Rebellion. But if we just knew, yo, you got to tune in because you it, it's going to be unexpected. You know, you can do unexpected title matches, unexpected debuts, start of huge angles. I would do it. You know, I think it would be, I think I it would be worth it. I think they would be the highest rated shows of the year. Do I think they will? No. Uh, not because they don't want to. I just don't expect them to. And I don't, you know, I, I don't think that there's much data to support that live programming on Access TV is a hit. You know, so I, I don't know. I don't think they will. I'd be I'd be shocked. Do you think TNA should stay away from smaller arenas this year? For example, Don Call of Arena and a Rebel Center. Uh, I thought the Rebel Center, I think everyone most for the most part, everyone thinks the Rebel Center looks gorgeous on television. They could do every freaking show from there. I'd be I'd be good. Um, I just see a, a, a notification here. Eight hundred eighty three tickets sold for hard to kill. 300 remain that's i think that's what I, about what i was saying I, I was like i think they're going to sell in the 800 ballpark as a as a resident of resident of las vegas I, I can tell you if there is a show any show it can be fucking uh water boy on ice like and it's not sold out they're going to have people out there with free tickets <laughs> getting people in there so that's how i think Hard to kill will ultimately sell out, or I mean, how how it'll ultimately reach capacity is that you know Vegas doesn't fuck around with their shows like they're going to get people in there. It's going to be much like the Impact Zone in Orlando, like hey, let's just get them in here. But I think I think we're going to see um, a lot of free tickets on the streets that day. Uh, but yeah, the Rebel Center looks really good on TV. I don't even have an issue with the Don Call of like I know that's like a really small arena. I, I'm not of the the impact fan, the TNA fan base that says, "Oh, please run big arenas." I've I've never never been on that train. I would not run anything above three thousand people. I mean, look at the capacity for Hard to Kill in a great location, and they're struggling to fill it. Right, Bound for Glory last year, they announced a year in advance, and it took almost that entire year to sell out. So. 
to me, there's no data to suggest they could fill out, fill up anything above a 2000 seat arena. Uh, maybe 2,500. And then if you want to get ballsy 3000, but I, I would rather the show look great on television than, um, than try to shoot for the stars because then you start getting the fo- the photos floating around like AEW has where the, you know, the showing no one in the crowd, you know? So I'm, I'm okay with the smaller spots. I just want it to look good on television. That's my, my thing. When it looks like shit, that's when I get mad. Um, but if, you know, the impact zone in Orlando looked, looked amazing on TV and there were, you know, there was never more than 300 people in there. And they made it work, you know, and I, I brought up the example before of when I was I was there when Eddie, Eddie Edwards won the world title from Bobby Lashley. There was maybe 200 people in there. I'm telling you, there was nobody there that and this was the night after Bound for Glory. And this is why I've, I've said, you know, create an atmosphere where, you know, something huge is going to pop off the next night. Um, And they made it look OK on TV. I was scared to death when when the episode was going to come out that it was going to show no one there and they. They made it work, but I mean, I am telling you, it was dead in there. So I, I, I'm okay with like 500 C fucking places. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't care. I just want it to look good on television. All the, obviously, I want them to sell tickets because that's more more revenue at the end of the day. But you know, I, it's not that big of a deal to me. How long should fans give TNA to have a different feel? How many episodes to improve? That's a really good question. Um, in the summer, D'Lo Brown came out and said, give us three episodes. So you know what? Give them three episodes. I rebutted by saying, you should be telling people to give you one episode. Because as, um, as viewers of television, like, you know, let's say there's a new sitcom that comes out. You know, you watch the first episode and you're like, this isn't very funny. Like, are you really going to watch the second episode? Like the you have one chance to grab people. I've given up, you know, MLW multiple opportunities. Don't really like the show, but there's no way I'm watching three episodes. <laughs> you know, it's just not happening. As um, you know, as consumers of, of media and television, like just people don't. That doesn't work. You have to grab people in one. So I will say if you're watching, if you're someone that's watching TNA for the first time in a very long time, give them one episode. But for us who are pretty much watching no matter what, but you're kind of deciding, "Ah, I don't know if I'm going to punch out or not. Give them the three episodes. I'll say give them the full set of tapings after Snake Eyes. Because as I said earlier, we're going to be high after Hard to Kill. The company's going to be high. The wrestlers, the fans, we're going to be on a high. And that's probably going to carry into Snake Eyes a little bit. But whatever the location is, they're filming tele- television after that. I don't, maybe they've announced it. I, I've, you know, I've always said I never really care where they film. I know a lot of people follow that stuff. I don't know if there's, they're already, I think they're doing Orlando. But I will say give it, which is actually really smart if that's their first location. I would say give it that set of tapings and we're going to know right there if they're, you know, if they're happy being where they are or if they're trying to do something special, we're going to know. So snake eyes, we're going to be on a high, but that first set of tapings that is going to let us know what to expect for the new, new vision of TNA. I'm very confident in saying that. I don't think it's going to be something that, you know, there's going to be peaks and valleys. There always is, but I don't think it's going to be something that progressively through the year improves. And you know, if they hit us with the "just give us a chance," do do not give us that bullshit. Like you've had a year to prepare for this, go balls to the wall. So that's what I'm expecting them to do. And whatever that block of tapings shows me is going to be is going to dictate what I think TNA is going to be. Do you think the stink of LOL TNA will ever go away? You know, maybe not totally, because um, I mean, God, people, there's not a tweet that Vince Russo can can put out that someone doesn't bring up David Arquette or or a Viagra on a pole. 
Just look at his tweets. There's nothing he can say where someone doesn't bring that up. Um, so I don't think 100% no, but there is so much bad press on AEW right now, folks. And they have done everything in their power to change the narrative to where they are no longer the alternative. They are a knockoff version of WWE. They, they have become exactly what people hated from TNA back in the day. And, you know, what people disliked about WCW and, you know. And this is the perfect opportunity to step in, establish themselves as the alternative, establish themselves as something different, something serious, something less goofy. And um, they have a, they have a real shot here. Six months from now, will I say that? No. This the top of the year here, January, February, March. This is it. This is their their window to strike. The iron cannot be any hotter. I know it's a little cool right now, but I'm I fully believe hard to kill snake eyes like they're going to be the talk of the wrestling world. So that is their opportunity to strike and that is going to be their opportunity to gain these new fans and to change the narrative. And after that, whatever the result is, they're going to have to live with. But um, do I 100% think it'll go away? No, but AEW has so much negative press on them right now that you cannot possibly, I mean, it's the best thing that could happen to TNA, to be frank. How long before they rebrand as Impact again? Uh, 45 days. Do you think TNA should rebrand with a different logo and colors, or are you okay with the old school logo and colors? No, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with what they got with this, the, the old school one because you want to have a little nostalgia. Like I want them to move forward and be forward thinking, but you, you want to have a little bit of that as well. Yellow is my favorite color, so I'm, you're not going to see me complain about yellow on TV. I think uh, yellow with red would pop very, very well. And um, I'm good with that. You know, I have no, I have nothing against red. Like my favorite baseball team, the Angels, they're red. Their college football team, USC, they're red. It's more of a crimson, but they're red. Um, favorite basketball team, LA Clippers. They are, they've gotten away from it a little bit, but for the majority of their time, they were red. You know, the, uh, my favorite WNBA team, the NBA, uh, Indiana Fever, they're, um, Rebel jerseys right now are red. They are as red as red can be. Okay. I have no issues with the fucking color. It's when that's your only color. That's when I get it's, I, I mean, I've seen in freaking social media marketing books, like do not make everything red. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you have to have some kind of contrasting color to pop. And I think yellow is a great one. And I think a yellow is a color they should take advantage of because NXT got away from it. You know, maybe not gold. They were the black and gold brand, um, but I think that color is kind of up for grabs right now. So I would I would incorporate a lot more yellow into what you're doing. Um, but they're both colors that you can't you can't overdo. You can't overdo bright colors. Can the product benefit with more lucha libre? I'm gonna say probably not, but I don't mind lucha libre in the. Um, the context of Lucha Libre. Like if I'm watching a triple A show, like that's fine, but I don't know that Lucha Libre has ever really clicked in the United States. You know, it worked with Rey Mysterio. It worked on a much lower level with Penta and Phoenix. But other than that, there's ne never really been huge stars and AEW brings in mass men every week. And it doesn't, you know, there's some people who like that kind of stuff, but it doesn't really work. Um, I guess it does for them because they love to see people flip and roll. But it, it, it's hard to say. Um, you know, if, if they became a staple in the X Division, if there was a couple luchadors in there, it could work. Um, AAA is probably the company that gets the, the least amount of rub from Impact. Like you bring in someone from New Japan or um, even Noah at one point. But you bring in someone from New Japan, AEW, like they're going to beat their guys. You know, <laughs> you bring in someone from the Indies, that's a big name. They're going to beat their guys. They're going to beat their own guys with a drum, like a drum. But, trip, you know, the the luchadors are the one that, you know, 
I think they said a final resolution that was Samurai Del Sol's first win in Impact. That's crazy. You know, and he was in WWE. Uh, I think if they kept him around, I think that would be very beneficial for the division because uh, he can speak English. But I, th- I think you could pepper the X division with a little bit of, of Lucha Libre, but I just don't think it clicks with American wrestling the way that ideally it should. If you were to replace BTI with another hourly show, how would you format it? What would you want it to accomplish? You know, I'd want it, I'd want to, and they did this for a little bit in regards to what I'd wanted to accomplish. I'd, I want to see, oops, there goes my dogs. Or I had to pause there for a little bit to get them to calm down. Normally I would show my, my ugly face for one of these mailbags, but my kids are traveling from uh, Illinois right now. Uh, They're visiting their mom out there, so. They are in route back home and I'm constantly checking my phone. So I just don't want to do that on screen. But um, yeah, I'd wanted to accomplish as far as what, I, what I'd wanted to accomplish is just the, to build a little moment, more momentum leading up into the actual show. I think the whole format of showing us a bunch of highlights, a match that most of the time people didn't care about. And then it leads into the show where you're just watching highlights again to kick off the show. I just think it's a boring format. I thought Gia Miller did a good job on it. I think it helped her grow as a, I said that when BTI came out, you know, hopefully this allows Gia to, to, to grow because she was back when that show started, she was a fucking robot on screen and she's shown a lot more personality. I think the commentary helped her. So she was one of the bright spots. The show looked a lot better than impact. The music was a lot better, but you know, it, you are reliant on clips. You're reliant on Iceman getting on there from his cell phone and tell, you know, hyping up something that never happened. Um, and then, you know, matches that no one cared about. Like, you know, obviously there was the Iron Man match, which was genius when they did that. Um, as far as like a format though, for me, I would have I would have loved to see a new commentator as well, by the way, play by play, not just Tom Hannafin. Uh, I like that Gia was on commentary, but I would have had a different play-by-play person as well. Um, but I would have a couple matches on there because one match is zero matches, dude. I, I, I'm, I hate to tell you, no one's going to tune in for one match. I would have one match that's a little more of a showcase. Like it, it still blows my mind that there wasn't, you know, Shogun and Jack Price and and Jason Hotch and some of the lower card guys wrestling and getting wins and. You know, they don't have a performance center, performance center. They don't have an NXT. They don't have a rampage. They don't have a ROH to do this stuff. You know, like I thought it was a good home, you know, to where we could really see this. Um, it, it, you know, if, if the BTI was like more like their, their version of NXT, I think people would really tune in for it, but that's not going to happen. Um, and then I would have a match that has some kind of in, implications on the show. You know, I, I would, I would announce the match the week before, like, Hey, next week on BTI, uh, we're getting this, you know, and it has some kind of implications leading to, into the show. And then I would have an interview segment very similar to what Josh Matthews used to do on Explosion, but without the music in the background and not as goofy, but kind of a shoe interview to where we can get to know some of the wrestlers and why they chose to be there and what they want to accomplish in TNA. But like a shoot interview, not fucking... Uh, you know, being in character and normally I don't want to peel back the cur- the curtain too much, but man, in this wrestling landscape, they, that's, that's it, you know? <clears throat> so I, I think they would, would benefit. I think they have to find the right interviewer. I think, um, I would use, uh, Jay Chung as the interviewer. You know, she did a podcast for a little bit. She's got a great speaking voice. You know, I think she needs a little work as a ring announcer, but as far as her, her speaking voice, <clears throat> excuse me, very, very like sultry, very sexy. Like she would, I think she'd be a great interviewer. Um, and as, as good as a job as Tom Hannafin has done, he's not a really natural guy. You know, he doesn't sit there and just talk to you. Like I'm talking to you right now. It's always, you know, this, and, uh, and oh, this is just, you know, I am flabbergasted by, you know what I'm saying? So, um, 
I, I think to have an attractive female on there and just conducting a shoot interview and really kind of getting into the weeds and seeds of some of these guys and getting us to get to know them, you know, like, I mean, would you not get be a little more invested in John Schuyler's character if you just knew his story a little bit, you know? Um, so yeah, I would, I would, I would peel back the curtain a little bit uh, and I would have a match that matters and then a match where you're getting a glimpse into the future of the company, you know? So, and I think you could do all of that in 30 minutes and I think it can work. Um, last question here. What should we expect from the last two episodes of impact before the TNA relaunch? I got no fucking idea. I think it's most likely we're going to get, you know, best of TNA five and six, but um, I would imagine one of them has to be like a hard to kill, not a pre-show, but I guess a pre-show, but without the matches like the, I, there has to be, has to be, um, or, or I would love to see a show where they're just, you know, Scott Demore is not the warmest on-screen character. You know, uh, when he's sitting there and Josh and uh, uh, bu- bully, you know, but if he's just sitting here and talking to us, I think that would come off fine on TV. And, you know, he sits there and because one thing they have failed to do. And this is one thing I give Billy Corgan all the props in the world. They have they have really failed to communicate to us the vision of this new TNA. They have kept us guessing which for for social media purposes is probably a good thing because it has people continuing to talk, but they're not giving us a lot to work with. And people are having to create their own conversations. You know, so I think having Scott Demore at a sit down episode and maybe even some of the wrestlers too, without, you know, AJ Styles was here in this, like, no, just sit down and say, this is what you can expect going forward but be like really real and raw about it and you know and say hey we're we're gonna bring back shows that you you've been asking for pay-per-views you've been asking for like hint that lockdown and knockouts knockdown and the um i never remember what the x division one was called because it wasn't as popular but you know joker's wild which i thought was a great concept i think joker's wild would 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 be great for um for you know, these random, if they're going to do all these random episodes, like do something random, do Joker's wild, you know, to where random works in your favor. But if you, you know, if you just get on there and kind of hint towards what we can expect and, and, you know, you don't have to tell us, but hint towards something, give us something to work with. Cause they really haven't, you know, um, that's, that's what I would love to see. I think it'll be the biggest fart in a bucket if they get on there. And they're, they're episodes of best of TNA nine and 10. I think, I think it'll be a, 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 a huge whiff. I think it would be the dumbest fucking thing they can do. But if it's any kind of original programming, even if it's Scott Demore sitting in a chair talking about hard to kill, you know, like, like Tony Khan is annoying as he is. He does a, a podcast with the AW unrestricted guys before every pay-per-view kind of previewing the show. So, um, you know, it, even if you sat down and some, did some kind of preview for hard to kill and then announce people, announce the people like the rest of the match card will be announced. Give people a reason to tune in. Um, I'm 50, 50 on it. If they're going to do something like that, I can very well see them doing a best of Samoa Joe. You know what I mean? At the same time. But I'm going to give them a little more benefit of the doubt that they're going to do have a couple episodes that are going to at least attempt to get people um, ready for hard to kill. So that's what I got for you guys today. Um, hope you hope you guys dig it. Uh, we'll try to get some more mailbag episodes done. Got a couple of talking TNA podcasts coming with a couple uh, respected podcasters of you know people I respect. And then I'm, you know, I've got some more um, content. I'm kind of thinking about doing something where I'm talking about how to fix hard to kill, you know, how to make hard to kill um, more of an attraction without 
needing to announce the matches so much. You know, so I've got I've got a couple ideas here before we uh, before we get there. But thanks for checking me out. As always, I'm your boy BQ. I'm out. Peace.